This is She Creates Business, a podcast for wedding pros. Your host, Kinsey Roberts, interviews incredible women in the wedding industry who are making their mark and creating success on their terms. Join the conversation. Meryl, welcome to the show. I am so excited to be here, Kinsey. Thank you for having me. It's my absolute pleasure. We were just talking offline, you guys, and I get introduced to the most brilliant people from Megan Ely. She's been on the show before, and she is just, uh, I love her. She, I, without her, I don't know. I, she's so great. She just, she, I feel like she just knows what I need, right? Right when she sends me. And (laughs) Meryl, I'm just such an honor to have you here. I cannot wait to dive into these sales techniques. I know I was telling you offline about how many results I got from my 2000. 2018 survey, and we all want to know how to make more sales. So this is going to be exciting. But first, before we get there, I do, as I always do, I read your professional bio there at the top of the show. But if you would just give us a brief rundown of who you are and and what you do in the industry, that'd be great. I started a long time ago with my husband. And actually, we were going to start a chain of gourmet delis. Now, in 1987, there was no such thing as this artisan or gourmet or anything like that. So we thought we would do something really different. So we we found a deli for our first one. We put all of our money into it. We borrowed some money. And then the owner changes the price, changes it to $25,000 more (gasps) because of capital gain. And then we, we were devastated. We couldn't get it. We could not get it. So then we decided, then I got pregnant and then we catered my daughter's christening and everybody said, why don't you go into the catering business? So I thought, eh, why not? <laughs> because, why would we um, do that? You know, it, why not? I had the restaurant experience and so did he. And I liked the idea of not being tied to a restaurant. So we started, we did our homework because at that time, catering was, oh God, it was the redhead stepchild because it was like steam table food. It was just not glamorous. Nobody really paid attention to caters, but we knew that this was such a great market. Mm-hmm. So we did a lot of homework and we, we opened up and we've never looked back. But in the meantime of that, we started a, an event planning company within it and a decor division in it. And the reason we started the decor division Kinsey, I got to tell you this story. I, I don't want to be long about it, but I have to tell you this. No, tell me. So, tell us. <laughs> it was, okay, it was like the second or third year. No, maybe it was the fourth year in business. And I got this really great client and I designed this fabulous buffet. I mean, I was so excited about this. So I designed it. I had floor plans of it. I, was, I just spent, I, I even did mock setups at the shop, right? So I'm on site, I'm setting this up, I'm standing back, I'm admiring how fabulous it looks. <laughs> and then this florist comes in and plops on this god awful centerpiece right in the center of my table. I'm like, well, wait a minute, what are you doing? She said, well, the bride ordered this. And I said, oh, no, no, no. First of all, the, it was carnations, carnations of all things. I'm sorry, I hate carnations. <laughs> and they were the wrong colors. I mean, it was just awful. So I I had to keep it there until the florist left and I moved it. But at that point is when I said, okay, I am not going through all this work and not have the last say of the look of it because I was, the florist had control of my table because she sold something. So that is when we decided that we were going to do our own uh, decor. And I love that. That is so much fun. And then we started a picnic division because of 2008, you probably were not in business in 2008 when the economy just crashed and we lost 50% of our business overnight. Oh, um, wow. We had to come up with ways because we were um, an upmarket catering company and design mm-hmm. company and people were, you know, canceling their events all over the place because, you know, the market crashed and everybody was being laid off and it was just ridiculous. So then we we decided we were going to start something a little bit family friendly for corporations and do a picnic division. So that's in a, in a nutshell. Sorry about that. That took a long time. <laughs> that didn't take a long time. So I have a question with the when you decided to add the decor subsidiary of your business, is that like full uh-huh. decor for the wedding or is that just specifically related to catering or you do decor no, for the actual for the wedding? Whole, right. Well, it 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 started with full decor but not with personal. 
right? So okay. we would do, and then, so it was mainly it started like all of our stations, our buffets, our bars, and not centerpieces or personal. Then we decided, okay, we're ready to do, because if you go into something, well, for me anyway, I have to be, I have to take little baby steps to make sure that everything goes perfectly. And then I take another step and another step. So we had to take these steps. And now it is full, full decor with lighting and everything, centerpieces, personals, everything. Oh, I yeah. like that. And I, and I love it. And that means we have complete control of the event. Yeah, which I could tell you like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> who, who doesn't? Who doesn't? <laughs> who oh, doesn't is right. Yeah, that's right. Who doesn't love control? This girl, I do. Okay, so I'm just really curious about the picnic division. I know, I'm sorry, I'll get to the real point of this conversation, but this is so fascinating. I knew I'd be able to talk to you for a long time. So oh, yeah. with your picnic division, you... It, like the catering company you said was up market. So you obviously had to pivot a little bit, but it's not that you you did pivot, but you kind of just added another leg. So how did that, I mean, you still have it. And that was back in 2008. So it's obviously filling a need still, even though yeah, we've seen an uptick is. in the economy. Right. Well, because in the, God, in 2008, things were really strong. The market was really strong. People were spending money like crazy. And it was such a nice time. It really was because you would hear budget, but it wasn't like it was, it wasn't crazy. But in 2007, we started feeling something. And in 2008, when it just burst is that's when it was really scary because not only are we lost 50% of our business because corporation just stopped catering. It was like they closed the door. You know, what was the weirdest thing is, is, because it was right before the holidays, because it was in October. So not only were they canceling their holiday parties, but the ones that didn't go would say to us, can you hide your truck? I'm like, oh my gosh, this is getting really bad. That's why I knew that it was just going to get worse and worse. See, I called, I don't know what part of Colorado you're from, near Denver? Uh, we're about three and a half De- hours west. Uh, three and a half hours. Okay. So I called Catering by Design, who was in Denver, who's mm-hmm. a good friend of mine, and Different Taste Catering in Boston, who is also a good friend of mine. And both of her are upmarket catering. And it was like, how are we going to get through this? And that's mm-hmm. when we put our heads together and decided, okay, we can start a picnic division. We'll split up the roles. Meryl, you take the marketing. Jack, you take the menus. And Cade, you take the logistics. And we'll, we'll work on it very, very quickly. And then we'll mold it together. We have one website. And now it's Philadelphia's Picnic Company, Boston's Picnic Company, and Denver's Picnic Company. And then when other catering companies found out about this, because obviously we advertise it everywhere, and they would say, well, how do we get an Atlanta Picnic Company or New Jersey Picnic Company? So we were getting all these phone calls and we said, all right, let's sell it. Let's sell them the marketing pieces of it and everything that we did. So we did. So there is, I, I'm maybe 25, 30 different picnic companies around the country that is, has the same website, the same menus, you know, the same entertainment, that kind of stuff. It's, it's pretty cool. That was very deep because That's really I think cool. when crisis happens, crisis happens we need as an industry is to band together because we've got such talent in our industry and for us the three of us to to join together on this we did the turnaround was so quick we trusted each other we were able to get this up and running within weeks and it's like starting a whole leg of a, a a company it worked out really well yeah, so that I would suggest for any time that your your viewers have any crisis or something like that is reach out because our our industry is always so um, they help everybody. We're all competitors in a way, but we help everybody. Yes. And I like what you said that when crisis happens, we really need to band together. And that's where the best ideas come from, clearly. Yeah, yeah, mm. it was so cool. It really was. Well, this all didn't happen. I mean, I, I, okay, now I could just, okay, next podcast topic will be just about how you built this business. But anyway, okay, let's get to the tactics. Okay, Otherwise, right. I will right, just right. talk your ear off about other stuff. I okay. I mean, clearly, these businesses, where you've been in business for a long time. You've built these, you were in charge of marketing for this new company. So w- today, we're chatting about tactics that are going to increase our sales mm-hmm. immediately. And mm-hmm. I want to just dive in. You start wherever you think. I mean, we kind of talked about who the listeners are of my show. And so let's mm-hmm. dive in and talk about those tactics. 
we all need help with selling, no matter how long we've been in the game. I think uh, they. You always have to change your tactics. I think our I think our market is kind of cyclical, and we will have downtimes in our business no matter what. So, what can we do, Meryl? Tell us. Okay. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right because without sales, you don't have a business. We need to it's really train ourselves. And and the funny thing about our business is we're in this because we have a passion for what we do. We're not in this because we're salespeople, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that's two different. It is two different skill sets because not only are we, we are meeting with the client, we're doing their proposal, we're booking the client, we're executing it, and then we're following up. That's five different skill sets. And we're asking ourselves to do all of them. So it, it's, so what I see in, in this is that our salespeople need to be trained and, and ourselves, who's ever selling, we need to be trained to sell because we're not salespeople. Because true, true salespeople, they go for the kill, right? They, they go for the sale and then they move on. And we, we're not that. We're not salespeople because we're in this because we have a passion. We have a passion for creating or flowers or food or organization, design, whatever it is. That's why we're in this business. So I think sales is so important to train our industry how to sell. So I'm going to jump right in and start talking about how a client gets to you. Let's assume I'm talking about a bride and a bride goes to a venue. And actually, can see they're going to your venue. And the bride calls up your venue and you chit chat with them and they say, oh, I could bring any caterer in. And you're going to say yes. And, I, and you may say, and here's the list I have. Or whatever you do. But a lot of times venues will give because they have a catering list. So it could be one of three. I mean, it could be 10. It could be 20. It could be a a complete open list. So the bride will get six names. And the first thing that she does is what? What do you think the first thing she does, Kinsley? Kinsley? Emails all of them to get their pricing? Yeah, but before she emails it, what does she do? Asks me how much it's going to cost. Oh, no, before that. Oh, my (laughs) God, I'm the worst. She goes no, to the not. website. Uh, okay. I, <laughs> she I, goes I, to the website. Wow, I just skipped a 20 steps ahead. Sorry, Brian. Yeah, very good. Kinsey. Very good. Yes. Yeah, so they go to the website, right? So now they're looking at the website. And the first website she looks at, oh, yes, I could see totally see myself using this planner. But yeah, that, that looks great. And then the next website she goes to and she says, oh, I can see myself using this planner too. And then the third, the same, the fourth, the same, the fifth, the same, the sixth, the same. Right. So this bride, just by looking at the website, has said, I could see myself using this planner. Right. Now, a couple things happened here. We we know now that anybody could put up a pretty website or as and, you know, anybody could put up a shingle and say they're an event planner. Right. But we all know, I mean, anybody could put up a pretty website. So we are just we're deceiving them in such a way. Because you know, maybe you're, maybe your competitor does not actually do all these things that they're saying, or they, they they have is not great, or whatever it is. But the bride doesn't know that, right? So then they're on they so they're on your website. They could see that they could see themselves using you, and now they go to the contact page, right? And the contact page is where they're going to be asking for pricing and packages or whatever, right? So they're going to all six of those. That's why we think that people are only looking for price. Now, Mm. if this bride went to all six of these websites and thinks that I could see myself using any one of these, they all have all the qualities that I need, then what they're going to look for is, okay, well, they all have it, then who's the cheapest, right? And that puts us all as commodity. So that's why we're getting these emails that basically say, this is my date, how many people, you know, this is where I'm having or whatever it is. And then they are just asking for menus and prices or prices and, and whatnot. So that makes sense? Yes. Okay. So I want to do a little experiment with you. So what do we okay, do? A little oh. example. A little example. Okay. Oh, man, I already so, failed the first I, test. Just kidding. <laughs> no, you're going to do well. Do well. I just want you to say there's no gimmick here. There's no, there's nothing. I'm not trying to get anything over on you. I just want you to answer honestly. Okay. okay. So 
I have two pens that they look identical. So, but one of those pens, Kinsey, is a dollar and the other pen is a hundred dollars. So which pen do you want? The dollar pen or the hundred dollar pen? I want the hundred dollar pen. Okay. Then you have to be prepared to give me a hundred dollars. So there's no joke here. There's nothing. Are you going to send me a hundred dollars, Kinsey? Yes. No, you're not. Why are you going to buy, <laughs> why you're going to buy this hundred dollar pen? Why am I going to buy the hundred dollar pen? Yeah. Why are you buying this a hundred dollar pen? Because it's a hundred dollars. So I no. assume that it's better than the dollar store pen. Okay, good point, but that's not what I was saying. These these are both the same pens. They look exactly the same. Oh, they look the same. Do so they I'm work the same? Joke. Yeah, they look the same. They're, they they imagine you're standing at the store. Two pens are identically in there. You're picking them up. You see them, and one is a dollar and one is a hundred dollars. So which one do you want? They're identical pens. Oh man, now I'm cheap. I'm gonna take the dollar pen. No, that's not being cheap. That's being that they're the same. Why would you pay $100 if they're the same, right? Okay, Kinsey. Kinsey, what if I were to tell you that the $100 pen writes upside down? Do you want the dollar pen or do you want the $100 pen? I still want the dollar pen. Okay. What if I were to tell you that not only does the $100 pen write upside down, it writes in rainbow colors? Do you want the dollar pen or do you want the $100 pen? I mean, I'm excited about that, but I still want the dollar pen because I don't need a pen that writes in rainbow colors. Okay. So what if the $100 pen not only writes upside down, it writes in rainbow colors, but it writes underwater? Do you want the dollar pen or do you want the $100 pen? I mean, I personally still want the dollar pen, even though that's cool. Okay. Okay. So what if I were to tell you not only does this $100 pen write upside down, write in rainbow colors, writes underwater, but it also gets you in front of the line of all amusement parks, gas stations, and concerts. Do you want the dollar pen or do you want the high? Take my money. I want the $100 pen. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And what what was the example here? Why did that happen? Why are you taking the $100 pen? Because now I have way more benefits from the $100 pen. Way more. So so imagine these pens are, are businesses and they look exactly alike to the client. And if we're not telling them why we're different, then that's one of the big reasons we're losing these sales to price. You know, when somebody says they lost, you did not lose it because of price. You lost it because you didn't tell them why. What is the difference between the company? That is a major, major thing that I hope I can really instill in them is that to a client, especially over the internet, our companies look like these pens. Mm, And because we're all saying the same thing, we're all saying the same thing. We'll get you down the aisle. We did this. We do this. We have, you know, your websites are all beautiful. So now they're, they're seeing us as a commodity, chicken, chicken, you know, it's the same thing. So our, our websites are the pen. So it's our job to make sure that we can actually explain to them what our differences are. But we have to talk to them to do that. So your first technique that we're going to learn today is email to conversation. Okay? Mm -hmm. But before we... Let's do that. Funny story. Uh, I had um, an event producer work for me, and he he was a really great salesperson. I mean, he was a salesperson. And he was so frustrated because what was happening is that we were getting all these internet inquiries and they would never email us back, right? right? So I remember he said to me, you know, you know, Meryl, each night before I sleep, I, I talk to God. So why can't I talk to these brides? Why can't I talk to these brides? Because they're not calling him back or emailing him back because it was so frustrating. And I know that you might have that experience too. It's just like, oh my gosh, we can't get in touch with them. Yeah, you know, definitely before, have that. Oh, totally, totally. You know, be, before this, before the internet, or no, when the internet just first came out and people were doing this, I didn't look at these internet inquiries as real leads. I thought they were just shoppers and I wasn't going to waste my time on them until one day I started going through them. It was like, oh, geez, these are the venues that we're working in. These are real leads. These people are booked at these venues. So that's when you know, we started paying a little bit more attention and we were still getting the problem of why aren't they emailing us back? Because we're all kind of doing the same thing. 
we are, when we get the internet inquiry, we send them an email. It's probably like a template. Some of us will send photos. Some of us will send videos. Some of us, but it's usually a template type thing, right? So we looked at this because this was like a really big problem, a real challenge for our company. And we brainstormed. and We had to figure out how we were going to get through because we knew as salespeople that we were not going to book them unless we could talk to them because we know that the power of relationships and, and talking is so important in what we do in the, in the wedding industry. I mean, it's, it's not, we're not selling nuts and bolts. We're selling like these experiences. So we have to be able to talk to them, right? Right. So that was a huge thing. So we had to figure out what we were going to do with this. All right. So we tried some different things. And this is what has worked and still works. I think this was uh, 10 years. We've been doing this for like 10 years. And it still works today. So imagine you got this email. And it says, good morning, my fiance and I are considering having our wedding at Greystone Hall. As you are on the list of preferred vendors, I want to reach out and inquire about your catering options, packages, price ranges, and available dates. We're deciding between blah, 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 blah. Any details that you can provide would be appreciated. Thank you very much. Now, we know that she's copying and pasting them and sending to all six of those companies, right? Right. So. Now, we all six of these companies get this email, and now we're trained that we've got to email very quickly back, and we're sending these template letters out. And, and like I said, with either the you know, photos or, or, or testimonies or whatever it is, plus the template letter. So we've said, okay, we're not going to do any of that. We're not sending out pricing. We're not going to do any of that. So what we decided to do instead is, number one, we changed the subject line. Because the subject line on hers was wedding at Greystone Hall. And, the, and we changed it to, you've picked my favorite venue. Now, the reason we did that is because we know that she's going to send them to all six at the same time. Because that's what they do. They call all their photographers. They call their event planners. They, call, you know, they do that at the same time or email. So, and then as companies, we are all trained that we've got to get our uh, re- responses in quickly to our, our brides or our leads. So imagine that all these responses are coming into her inbox and she sees Greystone Hall, Greystone Hall, Greystone Hall, you pick my favorite venue. Well, click on that. for So that's the first thing. So if we change that, that is so exciting for her to see. So she'll click right away onto that. And now we, we are changing our email completely. So to answer Katie's, that was the bride's, Katie's email, we said, great to hear from you. Greystone will provide you a unique drop backdrop for your summer wedding. Elizabeth is wonderful to work with, and Festivities has the pleasure of working for twenty past 20 years. My day is fairly open, and I would love the opportunity to speak with you directly about your wedding details. Would you be available to chat this afternoon or this evening, question mark, and nothing else? except for their name. That's it. Now, we didn't send packages. We didn't send anything, right? Any pictures. They were already on our website. They already know what we can do. I don't have to talk about the food or our services or anything like that. They, they get that. My main thing is I want to have a conversation with them so I could talk to them and qualify them and then either book them or move on, right? Mm-hmm. So Katie emails back and she says, hi, Bernice, thanks for getting back to me. I am available to chat this evening after 6.15. I also have flexibility tomorrow afternoon. Thanks. And I look forward to speaking with you. Exclamation point. This is gold. This is gold. So now we have a, a, a booked meeting basically over the phone. Now, the what other people were doing, other companies were doing is they send them this and then they'll say they'll follow up in a week or whatever. I want to bypass all of that and get on the phone with them right away. And if we get we know that if you can talk to somebody, you can make a connection and, and start building a relationship from the beginning. And that is so important. So that is that. Let me tell you one 
that is from a millennial to a millennial. Okay. Okay. So Doug sent his back. Somebody said the same thing about how they're getting married, blah, blah, blah. And he sent his back at 318 PM. And he says, hi, Sierra. Smithfield is a great choice. I'd love to hear more about your thoughts for the wedding. Do you have time today for a call either during the day or early evening? Thanks, Doug. And she emails right back like she's texting at 318. And she says, early evening work for me. Can't wait for you to call. Done. This is now. So to get this conversation is huge. And any salesperson will say, I just can't believe I can't talk to these people. But now we can with just adjusting the subject line and changing the email, not giving them a whole, get rid of the template and make sure you end it with a question. Because as we as humans, we answer questions. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, that's a, I love that. I have a question. I have a question, Ma. But what if the cup, what if it's a millennial bride and she's on her groom or whoever couple and they're on their phone and you send the initial email, which I think is brilliant and they respond, is this qualifying? And they respond, I actually really don't have time. Could you just send me your packages? We won't do that. We'll just say, what we'll say is because then they're just really shopping. And, you know, we also found out is that, and I'll I'll answer that in a minute, but we also found out that brides want to talk about their wedding and maybe they're not. So if they're just asking for pricing, if she called back and said she just wants pricing, then she's not ready for me yet. Okay. Okay. So we won't, so we will say, oh, we just have to chat. If this is a busy time, I understand. I'll put you, you know, I'll, I'll save this or whatever it is and we'll follow up again because Five out of 10 times, she'll say, okay, let's make the appointment. Mm. Or she'll say, you know, she really is just, she really is just collecting information. Maybe, you know, she's not even engaged yet. You got those. We get them all the time, right? They just want to know what it's going to cost. Now, uh, we could, we always do, if we have somebody that's very, very persistent, we will give a range over the phone, but we won't send them any material. Because they, they can see what we do on the website. We can give them a range, but I'm not having them taking our ideas and then give them to somebody else, which we all know about intellectual property has been a big issue. But th- th- more so is we just want to talk to them. And I think that talking to them is now it gives us a chance to actually qualify. Now, one thing that I want to make clear is that if they email you, you email them back. If they call you, you call them back. So don't call them if they emailed you because they're just going to get so frustrated with you and upset because a lot of times they're doing this at work. So, and actually the not actually pulled 20,000 brides. And that was one of the questions. And they, and they said, no, you, if we email you, you email back or they, they're going to start texting us too now. But right. that technique, really, really works. So that is number two technique is called email to conversation. And it truly, truly works. So we've checked off two things like we we didn't send them our information, they already know about us, but we we changed the subject line. And we ended the email in a question. If we put that question in the first paragraph, it would never get answered. By always leaving a question, I always, to every email I do, is, is end it in a question if I want to hear back from them. If I'm just answering the question, I'll just answer the question. But if I want to hear, like if I'm talking to a client, you know, I need to get some answers and stuff, I will end it. What are your thoughts? I'll end it with or something like that. Or thoughts, question mark, because they will always answer back, which is wonderful. And it's usually right away, which is a nice thing. All right. So now this same client, we get a conversation with them, right? And before I start with the next technique, I want to make sure that uh, we all understand that, you know, everybody talks about go for the close, go for the close, go for the close. It's not the close. It's the open that is so important that, that having that conversation. And I think that we do a big disservice to us is that When an inquiry actually or a a lead actually comes in through a phone call, maybe, 
and we are rushing. We have a proposal to do. We have to go on site, we have whatever it is. We have to talk to the linen company. We have to do whatever. We are rushing these people off the phone. And that is one of our huge mistakes because in this day and age, if we actually get somebody on the phone, we've got to keep them on the phone. We've got to start the opening process and the qualifying process. Okay. All right. So then we get this phone call. What do you think the four W's are? Oh my gosh, I don't want to answer. I answered the pen question wrong. I know you know it. I know you know it. I know you know it. You may know it not as the four W's, but they are the who, what, where, when. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we are accustomed to asking those things. So a client calls and they say, I'm getting married in June. And and we say, oh, congratulations. Where are you having it? Greystone Hall. When are you having it? In August 16th. How many people are you having? 150. What, what is your vision? I hate that. And we have got to get rid of that word. What is your vision? For two reasons. But the main reason is everybody asked it. So they're expecting that. Right. So I'm saying don't do that because that same bride called all six of these companies and they're all saying the same thing. Oh, congratulations. I'll send you this. Da, 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 da. We're all saying the same thing. I'm mm-hmm. saying be different. And Switch it up a little bit. So these are our qualifying questions that we use. They call and say, hi, I'm getting married in June. And the first thing out of our mouth is, oh, my gosh, you know, I have been doing this for so long, but I get so excited to hear about the engagement story. Tell me about your proposal. And they are so taken aback by this because the other companies just ask me who, what, where, when. And now she's like a little bit taken aback. And then she's all excited because she gets to talk about how everybody wants to tell them about their engagement proposal, right? So the the salesperson has to treat this. They have to ask with their personality. So maybe they're young and they just got engaged themselves. And they could say, you know, I just got engaged. Tell me your, tell me your engagement proposal or tell me how that happened. Or you could be older and, and say, oh, my daughter just got engaged and her proposal is so cute. Tell me about yours. So what it does, it, it starts conversation. And she may say after that, and by the way, they always will answer that. They will always tell us their story. And listen to what we're finding out here. Okay. So she may say, well, we were on top of the Eiffel Tower. And I'm thinking, cha-ching. Or she may, right? Or she may say, well, we were at Denny's and he put my ring in the parfait. It was so cute. I had a dig to get it. Now, two different brides here, right? Mm -hmm. Are they two different brides we're talking to? Totally. That's right. Okay. So, okay. So now there are six qualifying questions that I'm going to give you that I'm telling you will change your world. We could stop right after this, and I think that you would get your money's worth. <laughs> it's free to them, isn't it? <laughs> I feel like I already got my money's worth. Yeah, but yeah, give no, us but, these six questions. But, it's free, yeah. though. It's free. But right, you guys know what we're saying. All right. <laughs> All right. So now, so now, the bride is telling about the story, and she's all excited. She took her guard down because they call us there's a guard because to them, we're still salespeople. We're still trying to sell to them. So they're telling us the story and and I'm writing everything down that you're telling me. So then I would ask them, well, how would you like your, how would you want your guests to feel when they leave your wedding? What a powerful question. Because she's going to say, well, actually, I want them to think it was the best party, amazing dancing and the band playing all night long. Or she could say, I want them to think it was the most sophisticated, elegant wedding they've ever been to. Are we talking about two different brides here? Yes. Yes, we are. Because we all think that we know what the brides want because we do what we do, but we don't know what they want. Everybody is so different. So that's not the second question. Then as we're talking, and I'm writing all this down because if she wants sophisticated elegance, if she wants this, if she wants this, I'm writing everything down because I'm going to use all this information later. So then we're chatting, and then I'll say, so tell me, what's a must-have? 
she's going to tell me what her must have is. And that is, I must have a photo booth. I must have whatever it is, is her must have is really, really important to her. Then I would say, well, what's a deal breaker? She may say, I mean, we, I don't know what she would say, but she could say, oh, I would just die if I saw one of those chocolate fountains or whatever. Mm-hmm. We get to know what is, what is something that she absolutely doesn't like because everybody's different. And you may actually be pushing, you may be the company that is pushing this chocolate fountain. And if we get to find out that she hates the chocolate fountain, we'll never push that because we have the knowledge. All right. So I would say to them, I would say, you know, so I, I bet you've been to a lot of weddings recently. And she'll say, yes, I've been to 10 just last year. And I'd say, oh, geez. And I'd say, well, tell me, what three things did you love about them? And she's going to tell me what she loves. And this is so important because she may say, oh, I really liked it when they had dancing in between courses, or I loved that they didn't have the receiving line, or I loved whatever it is. We won't know until we actually ask this question. Then I would say, well, then tell me what three things you didn't like. I hate it that they had dancing in between courses. I hate it that they had a receiving line, whatever it is. We're going to know, but you can't ask the, both those questions in one. You can't say, well, tell me what three things that you loved and three things that you didn't love, because they're only going to answer one of those. And we need both questions answered. We want to know what she loved and what she didn't love. So that's why they have to be asked separately. Okay. Okay. Am I going too fast? Nope. That's good. I think I, was that okay. six? I feel like that was six. No, I have one more. Oh, do you put the three things together, but ask them separately? No, I just add it wrong. <laughs> There's one more. <laughs> Sorry, Kinsey. It's fine. Right, you can do whatever you want. Then, but, okay. So the last one we would ask is, do you have a Pinterest board? 89% of them have a Pinterest board. So we would say, can I jump on it? And she will send me the link. And there I'm getting on it. And the first thing out of my mouth, no matter what I see, is, oh, my God, you have unbelievable taste. I love it. Mm, Right? Or, mm -hmm. or, yeah, so now I see everything. I see if she loves all rustic. I see if she's a DIY bride. I see if she likes bling. I see if she's all over the place. I can see what she wants. So now when I am going to read back her story, Story to her, and I can really get a, a real good glimpse of what this bride is about. And I have so much information from her from just those five or six questions. So we have that she is married at the Eiffel Tower. We, we know that she wants elegant sophistication. We know that we, because of these questions, whatever they are, we know what she likes, what she doesn't like. And in this conversation, we're going to find out if she, um, because of the venue, she may say, oh, I, and I want everybody seated. I love that when, when the, we walk in and blah, blah, blah. So I, I, get, I get a whole picture of this, right? Mm-hmm. So these qualifying questions. So it's, how did you get engaged? Tell me about the proposal. How do you want your guests to feel when they leave your wedding? What is a must have? What is a deal breaker? What are three things that you loved? What are three things you didn't love? And do you have a Pinterest board? Those are the qualifying questions. And I'm telling you guys, if you follow these, I'm telling you, you will get so much more information and make a better connection with the client. Because now that you have all this information, you're going to take it and go to the next step. You ready for the next step? I'm like, I just, (laughs) I was like, oh my God, what's the next step? (laughs) Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> uh, now, are you? Is this just a wedding blog, a podcast, or is this for all event planners? This is so it's for all wedding vendors. It's for all wedding professionals. Wedding, Every, wedding, people who, okay. li- yeah, Go venues, ahead. wedding planners, photographers, videographers, calligraphers, they all listen. Okay, I, I do want to add one thing though, because these are not the questions you, you ask a corporate client. Okay, there's only two oh, questions we ask corporate. Okay, and I'm just going to tell you them because some of your listeners do 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 corporate as well. 
two questions that we ask a corporate client. So a corporate client calls up and they say they're having an open house at their office for 75 guests. And the first thing I would ask is, have you planned this event before? And she's going to say to me, oh, yes, this, I've been doing this same event for 10 years. So like I know it like the back of my hand. Great. Or she's going to say, no, this is my first job. And I got this thrown at me. And boy, what a chance to be able to train a new corporate event planner. I love that. So the first thing out of my mouth for that would be, don't worry, I got you covered. I will not embarrass you in front of your boss. Now she's going to be saying like, oh my God, that's right. I could be embarrassed. This is all on me. So I would say we will teach you the ins and outs, the ropes. We'll teach you about floor plans. We'll teach you about this, this, and this. This has been so successful for us because we have made these relationships that when these new corporate event planners become senior corporate event planners and they move job to job to job, they take us with them because they'll never forget what we did for them. Mm. Okay, so back to the seasoned event planner. So remember, she said, yes, I could do this with my eyes closed. And then the next thing that I would say to her would be, what role would you like me to take in the planning process? And she will say, I want you to do, she'll, first she'll say, what else, do you, what can you do? And I would say, we can order your rentals, we could do this, we could do, order the flowers, we could do this, whatever it is. And now she knows all the other services. And she will say, you take this, I'll do the linens, you take care of all the other rentals, blah, 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 blah and that's it. I mean, now she, she's working with somebody that asked her the question because there's nothing worse than event planner stepping on the toes of another event planner, right? So that's really, really important. And the only, there's two things that we have to do with seasoned corporate event planners is when you say you're going to get the RFP out to them, you get it out to them the day it was is scheduled, if not earlier. Not a day later, do not call back and say, I need more time. And then when they call you or email you, you call or email them right back. It's really, really important with corporate event planners. Okay, I thought I would just add that in. Thank you. I think that was was important. Love that. Okay, good. Now, we're still with this bride and having it at Greystone uh, Greystone Hall. And she got married at the Eiffel Tower, blah, 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 blah. And I could tell that this is my bride just by her answers, right? I mean, I this, yep, this is my bride, this is my kind of bride. But I have to find out if she can afford us because I'm not going through a whole meeting with her, you know, bringing her in and having a meeting with her and have her realize, oh, that's too much money. I would refuse to do that or send a proposal out to her. I'm not, you know, proposals take 45 minutes to do and that's a lot of time. So Salespeople, and not only salespeople, when I say salespeople, you guys, I'm talking about anybody that actually talks to the client. To me, I always call them salespeople because I want that that idea of always having to be sales. We always have to be salespeople, even if we're owners in our business or whatever. So we've got to figure out if they can afford us. And you can't say what's your budget because we all know that they reading everything and the, all the magazine and blogs are saying, don't tell them your budget because they'll eat it all up. So they're not going to tell us their budget. And we can't ask that. It's like a real taboo question. But what I can do is now we are going to tell a story. And storytelling is so important. But what we're going to do is we're going to take all the information that we had with this client. And I would say to her, okay, I want to make sure that I have this right. I'm going to um, do a little recap. And she'll say, great. So now guess what I'm doing? I am telling her story of this wedding that we just talked about. The first time that anybody's ever told her the story about her wedding, she's told the story in her head a million times, but nobody's actually told the story yet. So now I'm telling her the story. So I'm going to say the guests will arrive and they will be greeted by the ballet parking. Then they'll be escorted to the pond where there'll be refreshments, blah, blah, blah. And it goes on and on. We're talking about how 
the simple elegance of the flowers that will be cascading, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm literally telling the story of all the things that she talked about, right? And we'll do dancing in between courses. And, and then she'll, she, you have her in your hands right now. She goes, yes, that's it. That's exactly it. It's like, great. Well, I can give you a range of what that would be. And then I would say it is, it, it depends who you are, but if it's a caterer, a caterer would say, well, between 150 and $175 a person. Or if it was a, a event planner, event planners know ranges. They know what kind of bride they're talking about, and they can certainly give a range. Am I right? Right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So they give a range. So then after you give the range, the next thing you do is say, are you comfortable with that? And shut up. Let them answer. And she's going to say either, yes, does it include this, this, and this? Then you answer her. Or she's going to say, no, you know, my father gave me $10,000 and that's what I have to work with. And I would hang up on her now. I'm going to give you another technique. So that technique, the one I just gave you is Technique number five, are you comfortable with that? And shut up because we have to know if we gave them, we gave them the price. They're all excited about this. They you told them this great story about their wedding. And now they're getting the range of a price and they're going to either agree or disagree. If they agree, that's great. I want to set, go through the next process. If they disagree, then there's an issue here, but I'm not going to hang up on them yet. Like if I was a venue or a catering company that has a venue, they might have a a, um, minimum. Well, they're not going to reach the $15,000 minimum, right? So a lot of times people would just hang up on them or not hang up, but, you know, just say, well, why don't you try this, uh, this place and this place? But I'm saying, don't do that. Let's do technique number six which is the event cost analysis, okay? Now, here I have this upset bride here. I mean, she's very upset. Her father gave her $10,000. And remember, there's a lot of uneducated about our industry fathers out there, right? I mean, they give their daughter $10,000. That's a lot of money for one day party in their mind, right? Yeah. They don't know. They don't know. So, you know, it could be that just like, like that. So, Now she's all upset. I'm not going to hang up on her, but I am going to say to her, okay, hold on. Let's go through this together. Don't get upset. We can, we can, let's work through this together. And now, because what's happening in her mind is that all she's running through her mind is how upset she is that she just heard her, her perfect wedding and now she can't have it. Right. So I've got to get her mind off of that and I need to give her a tail. So then I'm going to say to her, all right, Katie, I'm going to help you with this. Do you have a pen and paper right there? And she'll say, yes. And I said, grab a calculator. And she'll say, okay, I got one. And I'll say, I'm going to call out some numbers and I want you to write them down. Okay. And she'll say, okay, I got it. She's got to be doing something. Remember, she's got to get that out of her mind. So now I'm, I'm acting as a caterer now, right? So I'm going to say, okay, Greystone Hall is $6,000. Write down $6,000. Now, you said you wanted a DJ instead of a band. So write down $1,600. Write down $1,600. Okay, you said you wanted elegant but sophisticated and simple flowers. So write down $3,000. Okay, so where are we, Katie? Could you add that up? I don't know how much it is. Um, I can't do math, you guys. You know this. All right. So let's say it came to $9,000. And now she knows that she didn't get the caterer in, right? So she knows that there's $1,000 left for catering. So what is going through her mind is, I need more money. I'm going to have to just call my father and get more money. You know, it's right here. This is exactly what I want. And I'm going to get more money. So does that happen that they can get more money? Sure does. It definitely happens. And it definitely doesn't happen, too, because they may say to you, that's all I have. We are paying this for ourselves, by ourselves. And then I would try and recreate a different style wedding for her. 
maybe late eight o'clock uh, evening ceremony with like champagne and strawberries and something like that to be able to help her in this budget that she has. But regardless of what happens, this bride will never forget what you did for her about because we build her up. She got all excited. She's hearing about her dream wedding. And then she had that big letdown of, I can't afford it. So regardless if she can get the money or not, let's say she can't, she will never forget you. And she will tell all of her friends about your business. It just, it happens. We hear it all the time. Now, these are not techniques that we just, I mean, we've been using these techniques for years. Because mm-hmm. I'm always seeing what the, what the challenge is and how we can change it. And, and I use my salespeople as guinea pigs. <laughs> because we know what works, what doesn't work. Right. So they love this cost analysis thing because it really weeds out. You know, are you comfortable with that? And the cost analysis is great. So now we're able to move on to the next step of getting them in to the office. Because now we want to meet with them. So... And they want to meet with us because we want to show them linens and China and fun things, right? So now we, we she's accepted. She says, yeah, this is great. This sounds great. It's like, okay, let's, uh, what is, how does Tuesday look for you? Tuesday looks great. Now, the next thing I would say, is there anyone else helping you make this decision? The reason I'm saying this is because I'll be damned if I'm going to do a meeting and then have Another meeting because her mother wasn't in town, her fiance wasn't there, whatever it was. So that she may say, yes, my best friend. And I would say, my best friend, Julie. And I would say, oh, great. Can Julie come on Tuesday? She said, no, she's out of the country. And I was like, oh, you know what? You probably wanted her there with you. Let's make it a time when Julie can be there. We want to make sure that we're talking because that person that's helping them is the influencer. That's the, the, it's not the decision maker. I think the person that writes the check is not the decision maker. It's the influencer who has her ear. And that could be the mother of the bride. It could be the groom. It could be, it could be their best friend. It could be their, whatever it is. We have to figure out who that person is. Because what you don't want to happen is that influencer gets to go to your competitor and doesn't get to go to you. Now, they have nothing to compare it to, so they're going to go with the, wherever the influencer company went with, you know, what, whatever company that influencer went with. That's right. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So, I am going to crush these show notes, I promise. I want to make sure we get everything in there. I did want to just ask really quickly, when a person, when you've, you've gone through the cost analysis and they're just like, no, this is all we have, we're paying it for ourselves, how do you just gracefully let that person go? When you just like, I'm sorry, I just cannot work with a thousand dollar food budget for 150 people or whatever. How do you gracefully just say? But they know. Okay. See, they know that. They see it. They see that you can't do that. Do you know what I mean? Whether I'm a florist or whatever it is, they'll see that. That you know, there's no way. Or we would say to them, I understand that, and and I get that. It's very important to keep to your budget. And then, like I said, I would try to see what I could do for them for that amount. And it's not going to be what they want. I mean, if she had a sit down dinner in mind, then she's got to make some big decisions. Like she spent a a good wad on the venue. She's going to say, you know, she's going to look at this venue and say, that's 6,000 and my 10,000. So it wasn't really good thinking on her part. She's going to have to make some real decisions here. The only way that I would know how to say it if she replied to something like, do you think I can get out of Greystone Hall? And I was like, I don't think so. I think, you know, cause I know the contract and that's where I would try and change her into different things. You know, maybe she was having a band. I would say, let's go with the DJ, you know, so we can have that. Let's go with a later time or let's go with an earlier time. Let's make it like a brunch type of brunches are expensive. Never mind. I would never say that, but you know, I, you know, it's hard for me to explain, explain what I would say without them knowing what exactly it is and where we are money wise. But I think that they will, they will know, they will let you off the hook mm-hmm. and she's going to thank you. She's going to say, I can't tell you how nice this was for you to help me like this. I really, really appreciate it. And you know, if I get some more money, I'll call you back. And guess what? Some people do. Some people do. Right. But we found out that 
the ones that we were able to qualify this way that we book because we've made this connection with them. We were different from everybody else asking the who, what, where, when. We understood. Oh, I have one more. One more. I'll leave you with this one. I love this question. Okay. This is the last one I'm going to give you for now until part two. So one of the questions that we like to ask is, what comes to mind when you think of a professional, I'll say photographer, right? Let's say I'm a photographer. And she'll say, she may say, I don't even want a photographer. My mother is making me get a photographer. I'm fine with my friends taking the photos. I can't stand those pose shots. I can't stand the um, lights in my eyes. I can't stand being pulled from here to there. The only reason I'm doing it is because of my mother. So what kind of information did that photographer get with just that statement? A ton. Because now that photographer, she could send her proposal and now this bride opens it up and she's reading it only um, candid shots, no pose, no lighting, no this, no this, 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 we'll do this, this, and this. And she's going to read it and she's going to look at this and she's going to say, oh my gosh, she gets me. Mm. I'm booking this. I'm book- And it could be a thousand dollars more. So it's not price. It's that we're not asking the right questions to find out because if that photographer didn't ask that question, they're going to sell what they normally sell and they're different packages and they're different there. Now, right now she's going to go with the lowest price one because it doesn't mean anything to her. Right. She doesn't right. want photographer. She wants her friends doing it. But since she has to get a photographer to appease her mother, she's going to go with the, the least expensive until she sees oh my gosh, this photographer gets me. And she's going to go with that photographer, even if it's a thousand dollars more. It, it happens. It is just, it's so cool to see when stuff like that happens. I was just going to ask you really quick a uh, follow-up question. And I, I promise this will be my last question. So sometimes what I've heard like in Facebook groups or what have you, like after they talk to the client, they just send a contract, which is, you know, through Dubsado or HelloSign or what have you. They send the contract and an invoice, they sign it and pay, and then they're they're a client. Are we saying that we should be making kind of customized invoices based on the information we have found from this informative conversation? Yes, yes because definitely yes. And even if it's just because you don't have to give pricing, but you got to get them to book you. So you got to get them to give you a deposit of some type. But I'm a firm believer in, in sending out a, a well-crafted proposal. And I know some people don't, but in, in my industry, where I am in the catering industry, I mean, it, you just can't, uh, you know, it's, there's a menu involved, but there's a lot of stuff happening. There's a lot right. of, of stuff happening. And especially if they don't have an event planner, we are the event planners then, and we, we get everything that happens. But to, to answer your question, though, the, when we send out our collections, which is like a huge proposal. I'm going to save this one for your next call. But anyway, the collections is something that's great because it is, it's like a package, but we don't call it a package. And that is the proposal without, it has some pricing in it, but it's a little structured a little differently. And then we go right to contract. So your Facebook people are kind of right in that respect. But, you know, you got to you got to give them. I mean, if you're just sending out if you send out an invoice with just the one conversation and not give any detailed stuff about what you talked about, I think you're hurting yourself. It it depends. Let's figure out what the booking ratio is on people that do that. That may be interesting. I mean, I booking ratios are really important to figure out. You know? I agree. I agree. Especially for well, and I'm thinking for someone like myself for as a venue, you know, we we were chatting offline that we are open concept. So we don't do catering or in house planning or anything like that. So really, my proposals are essential. They're they're different, but they're also the same because the price of my venue is the price of my venue. It's not a per person rate. Yeah, but you know, not really, though. But not really. Because okay, tell here's me more. the thing with venues, because we actually have venues, too. And if a client doesn't see what the whole picture is, the dollar amount, because you have so many, you saying that they could bring any caterer if they have the right insurance. Is that what you say? Uh, more or less, sure. Preferred list. We have a recommended yeah? list. It's not preferred. Okay. 
So what happens when the, the shitty caterer comes in? That hurts you. That hurts your reputation. I guess that's on a side note. But what I would suggest doing is getting a sample menu from all of your caterers. So you can add that into the, the venue and any other things and give them an estimate of what a full-blown wedding would be. Really? They have to walk away there knowing, yes, I would definitely do that. That has helped us so much in our venues because they feel like they have to be an accountant because when, you know, especially when we're dealing with hotels that, that we're competing with hotels, hotels give them this, this flat rate and liquor is this and here's this and you're done. And now with, with venues, we're saying, okay, this is the venue thing. And then this is the catering and then the flowers are this. And then you have to bring in, I don't know how you do the alcohol there, but you know, there's all these things and they say, like, oh my God, I have to deal with all this when in reality they don't because there's so many professionals out there that will pull it all together, but it scares them. And it, it doesn't have to be a formal written thing, but they should be able to know how much it will cost when they leave your venue to have an event there for 150 people and in the range. I agree with that. But what freaks me, what scares me as a venue owner is in a proposal, putting, even if it's an estimate, because for, for me, like in my opinion, if a bride sees something in writing, it's like gospel. Like, well, oh, that's they, what it is. Right. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Don't put it in writing. Although, you know what I want to know what I did? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, for one of the venues, this is a cater trick that hopefully one of these caters will listen and come to you with this idea, but it worked. Okay, so one of these menus that we were on the preferred cater list, it was only three of us, right? And I had approached them because they were having issues with this hotel, the Rittenhouse Hotel, which is like down the street from them. And brides were coming in and saying, what is your package? Well, there's no package at a venue because there's all these different costs. We have security, we have this, we have this. So the vet, I met with the venue to do some brainstorming because I wanted to know why they're not booked enough because this venue is fabulous. And to me, I knew it was because of the salespeople there. I knew it. So I thought I would just come in, act dumb and say, you know, why do you think this is? And because it's such a fabulous venue, what I knew it would be is they weren't selling it properly because they, the clients left there thinking, oh, my God, I have, they're, they're nickel and diamond me. I have to pay for security here. I don't have to pay security. At the, and, and they think that all these extra add-ons is something that's added on to the price of they're taking away all the good stuff that the hotel is already giving you. You, you follow me? I'm sorry, but like, like you. especially for security, why am I paying? Why do I have to pay all this money for security? You know, that's right. even though there's security at the hotel, it's, it's all rolled in. So I said to them, okay, let's do a promo. And I'm going to give you my prices for what it would be for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we'll make a postcard up and we'll combine it with the venue, the liquor, security, the catering, and then we will put at the bottom of this, this is a trial or not a trial, ex expiration date on it. And I made these fabulous postcards for them. And it was just for my company. It wasn't for the other two companies. And I said, let's just try it. And what was happening is that these people were booking like crazy because they saw that it was an expiration date because it was. they thought it was like all reduced prices. But what we did was we just packaged it. So now the venue just keeps asking for these postcards and now are just saying, you know, this one's expired, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Cross it off and put the new date in there. And he's like, oh, my God. OK, I'm booking. <laughs> right. Right. So, <laughs> They're like, oh, God, technique. I got a card. But, right. Right. I got yeah. a card. Right. Yeah. But it's these little things. That, that it are really important, especially when you're combating a hotel or another, you know, other venues that, that have on-site catering there and they can get a one-stop shop price. But with outside catering companies, it's hard to do that. So you're right. Do not put it in writing. However, if you get a couple of your favorite caterers, and there's nothing wrong with having favorite caterers, by the way, because do. What, they're the ones that treat your place yeah, good. They're the ones that treat your place with respect, like it's their home. They wanted to clean it. They have great service, and they you 
the then you will get great reviews because of these great caterers so, and designers and musicians, all that. So I'm a firm believer in, in Lyft, but you have Lyft, so that's good. Oh, Meryl, okay. this is awesome. You are fantastic. I I've been talking, talking, talking. No, I like this. Well, that's what I like about the podcast. I like to let when I, I mean, what's the point of having a guest if you don't let them talk? You know what I mean? <laughs> Tell yeah. everyone where they can find you. Conversation. Ah, what I Yes. Conversation. Merylsnow.com. Yes. But you know what? I want to hear from your, your, your audience if these techniques work. And if they, um, and tell them to email me and, or text me or, or call me, whatever, Facebook me, anything. But, but remember, and what I really want to stress this is how I structured the questions is really, really important. Don't add any more, any more words. Um, just because we've tried them so many different ways and these, this is the, the sweet spot. So when you're asking those questions, ask them exactly the way that I deliver them to you. Okay. That's important. That's good to know. So yeah, Mer- MerylSnow.com, is. is there anywhere else they can connect with you? Facebook, Instagram? LinkedIn, Twitter. All the places. And I will put all of her okay. links in the show notes, you guys. Meryl, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you. Yeah. One other thing. I do these um, think tanks all around the country and they can find that on MerylSnow.com think tanks. And what it is, I do six hours of all sales, all day workshop. So we go into this stuff, but in, in deeper stuff. I mean, I'm not rushing through it and not talking over myself. And, but we, it really is really good. We go through all 13 sales techniques and then some. So it, it's a good one for oh, everybody, everybody your- in the event industry. Oh, I'm on your website right now. Okay. I'm going to link directly to that, you guys. They're her think tanks. They're six hours long. You do them all over the country? I do. Yeah. I'm, my next stop is, well, I just left Chicago. My next stop is Silicon Valley and then Austin, Austin, Texas. Oh, yeah. That's right. You just said you were going to be there. I'm going to be there soon at the time of this recording anyway. Right. You have to tell me what kind of food you're going to eat. I will. What, I will. They, I'll report back. What are they known for? I think they're known for everything. So Austin is like music and food, a lot like Nashville, I think. Yeah. Oh, I love Nashville. <laughs> it's great there. It's on uh, my well, list. This fun, Kim. Thank right, you, yeah. Meryl. This has been so fun. We will chat with you soon. Thanks again. Yes, thank you. Bye. Mm, bye. Thank you so much for listening to She Creates Business. Please take a minute and head to iTunes to leave an honest review so we can help more wedding pros find the show.